We usually do two runs during the day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and there's a should be a, a, a gate card for each one of them. You'll get both of these cards in the morning, but when you're filling them out, you should only fill out one at a time. That particularly pertains to the diagram on the back. In between the first run and the second run, it's very likely that the gates will be reset, so the positions of your gates may be different from the morning to the afternoon. You might not even have the same number of gates. So be sure to fill out only one card at a time and, and uh, wait until the second run before you draw any of the diagrams that go on the back. The Metro Ski League has its own custom gate card. The front side of it looks like a little chart and this is for recording what happens in your section of the course during the race. These particular cards are, are what, are, what are called a fault only style. It means you only record something when, when uh, something bad happens. There are different kinds of gate cards. They're called no fault cards where you'll put a check mark, for instance, for every racer that goes by. We don't make you do that. You only have to write something down on these, these cards if there's a, a missed gate or some other disqualifying action. On the card, there's a, a top part which has just basic identifying information on it. There's a, and we, we do ask you to fill all this, this stuff out. It's important to us because we have multiple races during the season and even two runs during a day, so some of this stuff helps us keep track of the cards. There's a date section, a place to fill out what kind of race it is, whether it's a slalom, a GS race, a boys course or girls course or varsity and junior varsity, so circle whatever applies there. There's a place to write down the gate numbers that you're watching and you'll be assigned the gate numbers when you get on, a, on, a, on the course by your chief gatekeeper. There's a place to put your name and whether or not it's the first run or the, or the second run. We usually try to do two runs during the day and there's one, one gate card for each, each run. We have a place to even put your cell phone number on there in case we need to find you after the race. So if you have a cell phone, please, please write your, your cell phone number down there as well. Lastly, on the top section, there's a place to indicate whether or not you ended up with any disqualifications for that particular run. So check either yes or no and this helps us go through the gate cards faster at the end of the run. Below that, there's a section that spells out different disqualification codes. We've talked about missed gates, straddling, being overtaken. We've also talked about limits to losing skis or binding releases. You get to lose one ski one time without being disqualified. So we have a code for losing more than one ski one time and that's simply a second binding release and that has a code of BR2. There are also ways, to, there's a way to be disqualified that doesn't involve skiing and that's unsportsmanlike conduct, conduct which has a code of UC. Then there are other codes that you can use on your, your card. One's DNF for did not finish. This is something that's technically kept track of by the finish referee, but if you observe what you think is a, a non-finish by a racer, you can put that on your card. And then there's a place to record a single binding release, which by itself isn't a disqualifying event. And here, you, what you do is you record what you see. In your section of the course, or if that's the only part of the course you can see, if you see a racer lose a ski, one ski only, by itself, that doesn't lead to a disqualification, but you record it as an, as an observed event. If someone else later on down the course sees, a, sees that same racer lose one ski, they'll write it on their card too. And between the two cards, we could tell if a racer's lost, exceeded the binding release limits allowed by the rules and, and disqualify, disqualify them for that. It's pretty rare for us to catch something like that but this gives us a chance of doing this. Now, if, if you happen to be on a section of the course where in addition to the gates in front of you, you can also see quite a ways above. If you saw a given racer lose one ski, put it back on, continue down to your section, and then lose the ski again, 
and you were 100% sure it was that same racer losing, losing, exceeding the one binding release limit, then you'd be able to write BR2 because you saw that racer lose, lose a one ski twice. So you, you record down on your, on your card what you are able to see, no more, no less. In the chart section, there's a place to write down your observations. Again, these are for faults only. You'd write down the bib number, your observation using these, using these codes and adding the gate number that it happened at. On the bottom right hand part of the, the chart, there's some examples for how the card should be filled out in case there's a fault. In this example, racer 27 missed gate 7, so it's MG7. Racer 63 had an observed second binding release at gate 8, so that's BR2-8. And racer 81 lost their temper, so it's an unsportsmanlike, unsportsmanlike conduct. You can write down what they did. If there's foul language involved, you can write, write down what they said. That would be for the coach to know. When you're recording these things on your, on your card, you need to be not only sure of your call, and we talked about that, that before, that there's judgment involved. One thing you have to be 100% sure of is the bib number. If you're not sure of the bib number and you, you, didn't, you don't think you saw it yourself, you can't mark down that racer with a fault. If racer seven went by and the next racer came by and, you, and you're not sure of the number, you can't assume it's racer eight. We have missing bibs, bibs in our set and sometimes the racers don't go down in, in numerical order like they're supposed to. So be absolutely sure of the bib number when you make a, a call and write it on your card. The back side of the gate card has panels for drawing diagrams of any faults that may occur, occur at your gates. Use the symbols shown at the top of the card to represent the red and blue colors of your gates. The top left panel is reserved for a reference diagram of the gates at your position. Using the symbol definitions at the top of the card, draw a map showing the, lo the locations of all your gate poles with the top of the panel treated as uphill. Label the gates using their assigned numbers and indicate your position relative to, to, relative to the gates with an ampersand sign. Then draw an arrow down through the gates showing the path a racer would normally take through them. Usually the normal path will be the quickest way to negotiate the gates but it is not necessarily the only legal way through them. This reference diagram is important since it can help us to figure out the other diagrams you may make during the race that show gate faults. If you have any questions about how to draw it or understanding, understanding the expected path through your gates, be sure to ask your chief gatekeeper. In this particular example, the gatekeeper has been assigned four gates to observe, numbers 5, 6, 7, and 8. The gatekeeper is positioned on the skier's right side of the course with uphill to his or her left, this is uphill, and downhill to his or her right. Gate 5 is a single pole gate which leads into a vertical hairpin combination, gates 6 and 7. This is followed by another single pole gate, number 8. The normal racer path is traced by the drawn arrow. After drawing your reference diagram, you should draw some templates. These templates go on the other three panels on the back of your card. Be sure to draw the template panels before the run starts so, so you are ready to quickly capture the path of any racers who miss gates. These templates are just like the, the normal diagram that we just showed, only with the arrow removed. During the race, you will not have time to generate an entire diagram from scratch before the next racer is upon you. Be prepared in advance so you can simply draw an arrow of any fault. The last diagram illustrates an example of a fault at the same sequence of gates. In this case, the racer turned around the correct side of single pole gate number five here 
but entered the hairpin combination from a disadvantageous direction. Instead of coming above the pole at gate 6, the racer comes below the pole at gate 6. After going through gate 7, the racer is not in an optimum position to make the turn around the correct side of single pole gate number 8, right here. Now as a gatekeeper you saw this, you saw the fault and you did your best yelling back at the racer, but the racer failed to respond and continued on. So you have no choice but to record a missed gate at gate number 8. In addition to capturing the path associated with the fault with an arrow, you would also record it on the front of the card. It would be marked as MG8 in the observation column along with the bib number 8, or the bib number of the racer that missed. Remember, you must be 100% sure of the bib number when you record a fault for a racer. So be sure to be looking for the number as the racer approaches you and be aware that racers do not always come down in expected order. When racers miss gates, it is, com it is common for them to get fooled by the same thing. When this happens, don't draw a new diagram for the same kind of fault. Just add bib numbers to an existing diagram if you already have a picture that applies. In this example, racers 7, 59, and 72 all missed gate 8 the same way. So you just add numbers to the same drawing. Even though you may watch 100 plus racers in a given run, you should find that three template panels is enough to capture all types of faults you will see. But if you need an additional card, ask for one from the chief gatekeeper. It's worth noting in the example fault diagram that the racer did not fault on gates 6 and 7, even though they were not crossed in the normal expected fashion. This serves to illustrate that on a two-pole full gate, here and here, the direction that the gate line is crossed does not matter. It only matters that the line gets crossed at all. So these were legally crossed. Extending the example further, upon incorrectly passing gate 8, right here, suppose that racer 7, uh, seven pulled up below the gate, either responding to your call of back or realizing that the gate was missed on his or her own. The racer could recover from the missed gate by hiking back, and back around above the gate from either direction and then continue on. The point here is that if a missed gate is recovered, it is as if the original fault never happened. In this case, you should record nothing at all on your gate card. Remember, we are using a fault-only style of, of gate card where you only capture events that end up as faults or disqualifications. Lastly, it is important that you not only record a fault on the chart side of the gate card, but also capture a good legible diagram of it where a diagram applies. A good diagram lends more weight to your observation and can be a key piece of information in a jury meeting. Oftentimes, a potential protest of a gate judge call is gate judge call is forestalled when the coach or racer is presented with a convincing drawing of the fault beforehand. If you do a good job on your drawing, you may avoid having to be a witness at a jury meeting. Conversely, if your diagram is poor or not completed at all, your otherwise valid gate fault call could be overturned, which is unfair to other racers who skied the course correctly.